Is there, um, do you know if there's new folks that, that are joining? Uh, maybe having, they're okay. So, you know, I think I've, I've just kind of um, just decided because it seems like there's more new folks and I wanna make sure that everyone has at least a general idea of, of, of the approach and what we're talking about every time. Um, so what, I'm, my name is Daryl Tonema. I, I'm a psychologist, I'm, I'm Kiowa Comanche and Tuscarora. I'm coming to you from the corner of my bedroom in Phoenix, Arizona. I, uh, I'm from New York, but we just got down here a couple of weeks ago because I'll tell you why, because it's sunny and 75 today. I think that's all I need to say. Um, my, I, I specialize in trauma and how it affects behavior. And probably about 15, 15, 20 years ago, I realized that I needed to approach trauma differently and overwhelm differently uh, because I was having the same conversations with folks over and over and over again. And then I, I decided to study up on it and research it and get trained in different ways to understand that the trauma affects not just the thinking parts of the brain, the cognitive centers of the brain, it affects the somatic centers of the brain, the, the, the survival centers of the brain that are way in the back and the vagus nerve. And the more I learned, the more I found out that the body is this whole system and trying to think our ways out of trauma was just one small piece of the pie. It, 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 didn't, it didn't have any, any, any attribution to what the, the, the body and the vagus nerve or, or even spirituality or prayerfulness and things like this. And we've talked about that. I'm down with all that. Um, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you what I know from this perspective. Um, so that's, that's kind of where we are. And remembering that the, just as a quick, look at my toys here. Our body's electrical. This is me being electrical. And that electrical charge relocates um, when there's a traumatic event or a chronic stress like, like COVID season. It relocates to the stress centers of the brain and it parks there and it turns to what we call stress or anxiety or even trauma. So it really is this physiological responses. Our body our hearts are pounding, our body temperature rises, our, our blood pressure skyrockets, feels like this, and we label it trauma, or we label it an anxiety attack, or we label it stress. And we're to the point now, eight weeks in, oh my goodness. And I think we have probably like eight weeks left, something like that, maybe more, I don't know. I'll just keep going until you tell me to shut up. Um, that we're... We, our, our goal, my goal is to always give like the theory and then the application and tools, theory, application tools, theory, application tools. Um, otherwise, it's just some good ideas that you that there's no connection to how you can feel better in your own skin. How can you help your kids at home? So we, we covered so many different areas. And last week we introduced um, somatic experiencing. Um, the work of, of Peter Levine, which uh, that, that stuff, that work has just changed how I, how I approach my, my work with folks. Um, it, it, it's, it's been transformational. Um, the things that we started last week and that we're going to keep diving into for a while now is the stuff that really has connected with, the, with my patients. Um, I use with my kids. Uh, I just did a webinar today to uh, the Native American Community Services back home in New York, and they had a group of kids there. I used it with them because what, what happens is we feel isolated in our sense of overwhelm. Your kids at home, the people you work with, the kids in the school there, uh, we sit there silently suffering because we think we're the only one that experiences this. And we feel crazy. We feel ruined. We feel broken. Ever since the event happened, or the or the abuse, and that gets stored in us, and we feel ruined, and then ashamed of the things that we've done to stay alive. To, to, if it's drinking or using or smoking, whatever, whatever it was, there's a sense of shame that's attached. That shouldn't be attached to it, but becomes attached to it because 
we think we're the only ones that experience this level of activation. And I say activation because it's this, it's electrical charge. It's not craziness, it's not ruinous, it's just activation to the stress centers of the brain. So our goal is to unplug those things, to collapse some of those things. I think in the future I've decided I'm gonna teach you guys a very specific tool called EFT, tapping. Um, I've decided I wanna teach you that tool, but I wanna wait till toward the end after we've really fleshed everything out and you, you wanna this quick, powerful tool. But I think that all fits together. There's none, none of this is isolated. It's all one big, ooh, there's a smart word I want to use, thingy of, that's not the word, but I'll, I'll shout it out later when I think of it, um, uh, of understanding of how it affects us. So if you remember last time that, remember our brain here, that trauma and overwhelm is stored right here in the brain. And this is the sensation center not the thinking center. That's way up here. That's right beneath your unibrow. That's the thinking center. This is where you label. I'm sad. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm hurt. Um, that's where we put those labels on. Um, I'm scared. That's where the labels occur. The things that we label occur back here. My heart's pounding. I'm, I'm tight. I'm weak. Uh, maybe we label that fear. So what we do is we look at context and there's something happening that is fearful or we're running and there's dogs chasing us. And then this part of the brain wakes up and says, we must be scared. We're running. So we want to do is dive into what this experience back here is. So we don't have to label it. We wait to label it. And the brain refires and rewires in a more sovereign way. And that's, and that's really my, my, my goal is to have you, your kids, your students, your honeys, just stack up these sovereign moments. Just that this felt like this and I didn't react to it. And the brain learns something different and the body learns something different. It's no longer reacting, reacting, reacting. It's leaning into it. But we have to know what this information is first. There you go. Boom. I'm going to pound my desk. That's it. We have to know what this information is first because we've been too busy reacting to it and running from it. We have never got to know it. So any uh, trauma, somatic trauma research, limbic, um, limbic work, and limbic is this part of the brain, the survival centers of the brain. Any limbic work is going to say you have to start with the messages that the body is giving you. For the healing of trauma. That's limbic work. So if you remember last week, I gave you just a short list of what your body can feel like. And you're getting information is called enteric. The, 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 the information coming from the body north. So the brain can label it. It's called enteric information. So you're getting, and you're getting it all the time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Like right now, I can tell you that I'm warm. <laughs> I'm warm. It's March. I'm warm. Um, my back is tight. Um, my legs are twitchy. My feet are warm. My hands are a little bit tingly. But I'm going to label that excitement. Because I love having these conversations with you guys. I love sharing this information because it empowers our communities. So that sensation base, I'm calling it excitement. I'm not calling it anything else. I'm calling it excitement. That happens to us 24 hours a day. Your body's always giving you information. So right now, I'm just going to give you a list. And I want you to just sit there. You can close your eyes if you want. I can't see any of, any of you. You can close your eyes and, unless you're driving. And just look at the information your body's giving you. And I'll give you a list of words. Um, and none of them are right and wrong. They just are. Cold, warm, hot, chilly, twitchy, butterfly, sharp, dull, itchy, shaky, trembly, tingly, hard, soft, stuck, jittery, weak, relaxed, empty, full, flowing, spreading, strong, tight, tense, dizzy, fuzzy, blurry, 
numb, prickly, jumpy, tearful, goosebumps, light, heavy, open, tickly, cool, silky, still, clammy, loose. These are sensation words. And why do we say those words? And this is, I really want you to lean into this. I really want you to glom onto this because this is, the, this is it. This is the deal. This is the foundation. Once you lean into this, that part of the brain is the language of sensation. And this part of the brain gets its information from the, what the body does. And the body tightens up and it sends it there and you label it fear or stress or trauma or your alcoholism. You label it those things. Wait, get to know what it is first. Because if you've just gone with it and ran or used or hit or smoked or ate or drank, when that pops up, your brain's fired and wired that way. It says this equals this, firing wiring, this equals this. But what if we start practicing now that this doesn't equal anything yet? It's just information. I'll say that again, it sounds smart. This doesn't equal anything yet. It's just information. And until I decide what that information is, does it become something? So as you're sitting there, Take 10 seconds. I'm gonna give you 15 seconds. I'm gonna give you 30 seconds. And just scan your body, whatever information it, it is. It's not good or bad, it just is. This is the foundation of doing trauma work. Are you hot? Are you cold? Are you tight? Is there a tenseness? If you can't find a word, just point to it. Point to where it lives. So here's what here's what I want to do then. Point to where it lives. Don't do anything with it. Just say that's it. Because you hear me say this when you attend to a sensation, this is Peter Levine's word. When you attend to a sensation, it changes. If it's a tightening, that maybe it's associated with fear. If it's an increased heart rate, that maybe you're associated with fear or anger or frustration. If it's a tingling in the arms that maybe is associated with fear or anger or, or maybe which you might call anxiety. If you attend to the sensation, it changes. It's almost like, remember we talked about the sympathetic and the parasympathetic systems last week. The sympathetic system is what gets you jacked up, your fight or flight response. And the parasympathetic is what calms you down, brings you back to, to a calm alertness is the goal. We want to have fluidity. We want to be able to go back and forth smoothly. We don't want to have to have anger do that. We don't have to black out. We want it to go back and forth smoothly. And so getting to know it is the key to that. That's the foundation of the work we're going to do from, from this point forward, is getting to know this and how it changes, how it moves back and forth. Sometimes, um, couple things. Sometimes that information can be scary or uncomfortable, at least uncomfortable. Sometimes the information can be uncomfortable um, because maybe it's associated, maybe sitting calm and still like that, um, the prenucleus, that part of our brain that, that kind of goes into default thinking mode, brings up some past stuff that has a sensation base to it that we've attached fear to or anger. That's where growth starts. Hang there with it and breathe it down. Remember our heart rate variability, breathing three counts in, pause, seven counts out like a plane. Two. Oh, no. Three counts in, seven counts out.
three counts in, seven counts out, do it six to seven times. And here's the big phrase. If I were working with you and, and, you, and you start to feel that activation, here's the big phrase. What happens next to it? Remember, that level of activation isn't its permanent state and it's not its final state. It's occurring because it's picked up on something and your body says, do I need to fight? Do I need to run? Which all is associated with my body getting tighter, my, my pulse getting faster. That's all associated with that. But if we don't do those things and we hang with it and we tell it, nope, I don't need that level. And we just hang whatever the sensation, if you point to it, put your hand on it, whatever it is and watch it change, it will, and watch it come back. I was, I might've shared this with you, but I'll tell you with you again, because we have new folks. Um, I was up in Warm Springs, uh, working with the community there. And there's a big dude, there's probably like 50 people in the room. It was a smaller room, we were kind of crowded in there. And, there was uh, probably 50, maybe 75 people in the room. And there was this big dude in back. He's probably like 6'6", six, six, like 350 pounds. And I had noticed him while I'm giving a talk because he kind of noticed the room. He was like this, he had a beard. He was like, mm. like he just, he'd rather just rip my head off than look at me. He'd rather look at me without a head. So he's like, like this the whole time. And... So we're doing this, this kind of what we're talking about now. We're talking about pendulation and getting to know things. So I, I, oh, I did a, a way to slow the heart rate and things. And so the whole room has their eyes closed and it's just quiet. It's just, and we're doing this thing. And he stands up six, six, 350 pounds. And he says, I am so mad at you at the top of his lungs. And, and just between us. I try not to get anybody over 150 pounds mad at me. So, but this guy, so he's 200 pounds heavier than my limit. And he's like, I'm so mad at you. And so like my legs start to buckle and I'm like, <laughs> like that. And once I regained consciousness, I, I said, what are you, what are you mad about? And he said, I don't know. He screams at, me. I don't know. Just so we know, my friends. He doesn't know because this part of his brain is shut down. The logic part of his brain says, I'm not involved here. The survival part of his brain says, let's light the fires and kick the towers and light the fires. So that's what the survival said. So there's no logic. I don't know. I, I just feel it. I just feel it. And he had the sensation base and he labeled it anger. He didn't know why, but it was toward me. So... I don't want to use too much words because if I'm using language for somebody who's in this mode, it's going to make things worse. When somebody comes into my office and they're totally activated like this, I, I say, let's, let's get control of the body first. Let's start there. Let's not even have a conversation because this is shut down and it, the, the, the capacity for conversation is even limited. So six, six, three and 50 pounds. I say, do, do we know each other? And he said, no, like that. And he's just ready to rip me to shreds. I think I could run faster than him. So I, I thought, well, I at, least have, I at least have a 30 foot running head start. So I felt pretty safe. Then, then I said, well, let's, let's try to control that a little bit. And I said, let's just do nothing for a second. Let's not even say anything. Do you remember me using that big word? Prosody. Prosody, when somebody's activated like this, prosody is how you talk, how calm your voice is, um, how the words you use, how you're presenting yourself, that's called prosody. And I thought, if I, if I, any sudden movements, and I am going to be the headless psychologist. So I was using calm prosody. Well, let's, let's try to get that under control. Let's just do nothing for a second. And there's a, a lot of good things can come out of doing nothing in this moment. I'm going to say that again. I take all of my wisdom from Winnie the Pooh. A lot of good things can come out of doing nothing. So I said, let's do nothing for a second. I wanted him to borrow my safety. 
I said, just breathe. And remember our heart rate variability, we're trying to slow his heart rate down. We're trying to slow the game down. And so he's breathing like a bear hibernating. Like that. And I look like a chicken leg to him. And he does that, but he starts to pendulate. Remember, that's the word you want, pendulate. So he was here and he does this, he comes back. And I said, you feel different? He said, yeah. And he said, I'm sorry. He apologized to the room because all of us were shaking. He said, I'm sorry. And I said, I said, did calming down feel uncomfortable for you? And he said, he said, yeah, I, I can never be calm. And I said, what does that mean? And he said, when I was young, my dad, would come home drunk when I was asleep. And he said, he'd come in the door and I could see him come in the door and uh, he'd come, you know, beat me up. And he said, I haven't been able to sleep since then and I, can, and I can't be calm. So let's, let's put this through the funnel of everything we've learned over the past eight weeks is calm, sleeping is your most vulnerable state. What are you saying made total sense to me? If being asleep, you are total, totally vulnerable. And his body said, I'm going to do you a favor. I'm going to do you a favor. I'm not going to get you that vulnerable. So if, if we did this, so here's a sympathetic and parasympathetic. He never came over here. He was always alert. And so he went from alert to angry like that. Just flipped up like this. He had a hair trigger. Do you remember we talked about when the, when the limbic system swells, you have a hair trigger. And so he gets this information from his body and maybe it's hurt, maybe it's fear, but it's six, five, 350 pounds. You can call it anger and get away with it. That became his main tool. He could control his environment being six, five, 350 and being angry. If he was five, two and 125, maybe it would be constriction or maybe it would be sarcasm. But at that size, that was his main tool. So we had that conversation. And, I, and I, I've had told him, I said, I don't need to know the story. I just, need, I just want you to feel better. I don't want you to have tools to feel better. But he was comfortable telling the story. So what we, what we practiced was him getting that information. And rather than reacting to what the information, the tool that he used. Let me pause there for a second. because. Maybe it's important that I say this. The tool that he used was anger. The tool that some people use when they get this information is drinking. They get this information. His tool is anger. Some people's tool is drinking. Some people's tool is smoking. Some people's hitting, using. They, they, you're picking your poisons. It doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. But change of it isn't going to happen accidentally. You have to become aware of it and get to know it and then make a decision on it, a healthy decision, not a default decision. And it comes with understanding it. So knowing that the, the language of, of that part of the brain, getting comfortable with it, it doesn't have to be your best friend because like it's, it's, it can be uncomfortable. They can be scary. They can be historically scary. Maybe like for this guy, his heart beating fast, and his pushing against being calm was his, in his life was historically fearful and anger was the tool. So they don't have to be your best friend. We just want to lean into it. We want to get to know it a little bit better. And the more instinctual we come with it, the more it just becomes second nature that, that this is that. Let me wait for a second. Becoming sovereign over it rather than it being a bully. And, and, and trauma's a jerk. Trauma's kind of a bully. Pardon my mug. It's my daughter's mug. I couldn't find mine. Mine's much more manly. So the more you learn about it without it being a bully to you, the more you become, and here's a tough word, fascinated with it. The more you become fascinated with it, become comfortable with when i say fascinated with it is this how my body responds to this 
what do I usually do when this pops up? How, how do I know? How do I know what this is and how have I been labeling this? Become fascinated with how you're put together. That has changed my life, honestly. And how I approach my work is creator put us together unbelievably. It's amazing how we are put together. And become fascinated in these responses, this response is to help me survive and it's rooted 50 years ago, it's rooted 40 years ago, it's rooted epigenetically, it's rooted in my DNA, and this is how it looks today, but I'm going to make different decisions on it today. I'm going to approach this a little bit different today. That's how we change things. That, that statement right there, oh my goodness, good people, that statement right there reverberates generationally. You want to affect your great-great-grandkids? That's what you say. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to respond today instead of react. This information, I'm going to do something different with it today. That's a huge statement. Good for you for saying that. And the fact that you're on here I already says you're leaning into it. I mean, there's, there's thousands of people who aren't on here from the community. And you guys are on here and you're already leaning into this information. So God bless it. So parts of ways that we start um, getting familiar with the sensation base, with the language of the sensation. One of the problems with adults, this and getting to know the language of sensation is much easier with kids because they're more in touch with it. They don't have all the big smart words that we have. Well, I'm feeling a level of Magnitude seven of distress due to the chaos that is, oh, oh, oh. we use all these smart words. Whereas kids say, mm, like that, right here, oh, like that. They do things like that. They're, they're very in touch with the sensation base. So what trauma does is, it's, remember, it separates the mind from the body. Because the body has all the scary information we were, we've been talking about all day today. It has the scary information, so it says, well, let's just cut off the scary information then. Then you won't be scared. We won't still have that experience. But in doing that, we're limiting the capacity for healing it then. So we have to start reintroducing that. So, I'm going to share this with you before I'll share with you, but since there's new folks, I'll share with you again. So what I do when I work with folks, I actually have a box. I have a couple bags here. So let's say I have a bag. And I put, I'll put stuff in the bag. Okay. Oh, gross. <laughs> All right. And so I'd have you, the person you're working with, because we want to understand how to start expressing ourselves as a sensation, not logic, not, not labeling the feeling. You want to know what is the sensation of it. So I'll have you reach in the bag and try this. And just practice this. Oh, gross. Okay, I was gonna gross another way. <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe I did this. I put a tea bag, a used tea, a wet used tea bag, tea bag. Okay, but I would do it with my eyes closed. And so I would use sensation words to describe this. So it's cool, soft, mushy. It doesn't have any edges. It's flat. See, I'm using sensation words to label this, and we have to get good at this. Like I said, this is, this is the foundation. This is the deal. So we have to get good at this. So you can practice this all the time and, and, and everything because you need to get better at recognizing internal states that are like this. So then I'll have a person put it down. I'll have a grab another one. Um, okay, I have a, and I'm not playing name the item. I know this is a brown napkin. But what I also would do with folks, I would say, does, it, does this have a color in your mind? And to my mind, it's green. I can picture it green. Okay. This, I know that it's brown, but I would say crunchy, coarse, rough. I won't say hard, but that's not the word I want. And I, I, would, I would ask me and I would, I would say brown because I know that it's brown. But what I'm doing is I'm listing sensation words that are connected. And so here's what that teaches us. 
particularly if you've had a lot of trauma in your past, it teaches you to practice using that language. That way, when you get a tightening, a tensing, a tingling, um, a rushing, a cooling, a soothing, a lifting in your stomach and your chest and your arms and your back and your head, you can recognize that and you can use those words because that is the language of the part of the brain where trauma lives. Now, when we do that, it wakes it up. It wakes it up and says, hey, how do you know my language, dude? And he said, I just do. I rock. I'm good at it. So he said, how do you know my language? And once you know the language, it says, what do you want to do with it? What do you want to do with this information? Then you say, nothing. I just want to see what happens to it. And I can just about guarantee it will deflate. Because the question is, what happens next when you attend to a sensation? But we have to be able to have the capacity to know that it's a sensation. Another thing you can do to practice is taste. Um, I don't have a lot of taste or things. So I have tea in here. Okay. So close my eyes and um, mm, leaf soup. Um, hot taste of uh, uh, sweet. Uh, there's some honey in there. Sweet. Um, there's some bitter. Um, smooth. And I would put, I would have, I would have things that a person can, can bite into that have different sensations. So they can, they start getting practice saying those are maybe a marshmallow. They can, the flavor of it and the, and the texture of it or a Captain Crunch or an apple or um, mashed potatoes and something that kind of appeals to all the different parts of the palate and then have them describe it. Like a mashed potatoes would be mushy compared to a Captain Crunch. But what we want to do is have them start identifying those things that live in this part of the brain, then it, it increases the capacity for them to recognize somatic internal states. Increasing the, the oh, oh, I wanna, I wanna coin a phrase. Um, their somatic intelligence, huh? No, literacy, I like that better. Their somatic literacy. I don't think that's a word. I'm gonna write that down. I know somatic is, I don't think because somatic literacy has been used together. So if you wanna get the tattooed someplace, go ahead, but put my name at the bottom. Increasing somatic literacy, knowing the language of sensation base and being able to apply it when necessary. So I was um, at home when we're in, we're in New York, our res is just like right across the border from Canada. You can see Canada from the house, just the um, Niagara River separates us from Canada. It's right there. And so uh, we go across to Canada. There's a little town there that they, you can rent bikes and stuff. And uh, so you we went over there to rent bikes, uh, my little family, my wife and myself and our three kids. And I was, uh, Carminda said she was gonna pull, this is when Jack was younger. So she was gonna pull Jack on a trailer type thing. Parks had his own bike. And Gracie wanted to get a tandem bike. You guys ever see people on tandem bikes? Just so you know, when you see people on a tandem bike, it was always the person in back's idea, okay? It wasn't the person in front's idea because they're doing all the work, it's the person in back. Gracie says, dad, let's get a tandem bike. And I said, okay. Um, so we get on there, pause for a second. Remember we were in a tornado 10 years ago and we, I've been working with Gracie on uh, understanding just what we're talking about today, just as we're talking about today, and just waiting to label it, just waiting to label it. And so we have to go from up here, this hill, we got to go down this field like that, down to where the trail is. So I said, let's go there. And she's back there. And you can, I, hear, <laughs> I hear her starting to scream because she was this is probably five years ago, so she wasn't, she was 10, 11 years old. We were going on this hill, like that, and I'm like that, and I hear, <laughs> and she starts saying, this is new, this is new, this is new. <laughs> we get to the bottom, and we got to the bottom, and I was so proud of her, because she didn't label it fear. She didn't label it anxiety. She didn't even label it fun. She waited 
she said, this is new and I'm not sure what to label this. So let me wait. What an empowering moment that was for her. What a sovereign moment that was for her to say, I'm in charge of the labeling here and I'm going to wait. I'm going to I'm going to decide this, what this experience is for me when I decide. Whew. Girl, get it, girl, come on. Okay. Somatic literacy. I love that. All right. <clears throat> so I want to practice the, in, in Levine's work, uh, in this book here, Book there and um, trauma proofing our kids, waking the tiger. Was another book. The the the, the phrase he, he is is called the felt sense. Basically, somatic literacy. What you want to do, what you want to find out is where it is, what it is, hanging with it. Don't try to rationalize it. Don't try to say, here's what it is and here's why it is. Don't do that because it's not in the why part of the brain. It's in the what and the where part of the brain, okay? What is the sensation and where is it? What is the sensation and where is it? Not is, why is it occurring? That's not, that's not gonna heal anything, okay? Even if we did know the why, it probably wouldn't change anything. So don't even worry about the why. It's, it's gonna be a waste of time. And let it change on its own. Let it relax voluntarily. Um, so I'm just going to walk you through a quick story. Is that cool? But you have to engage. Just say, yeah, I'm going to do this. I trust Daryl. I've known him for a few months now. I can trust him. Um, I want to so, do this. What's that? I said, I want to do this. Okay, cool. So um, let's get comfortable. Let's get comfortable. Sit back in your chair. <clears throat> Um, push your feet hard in the floor. Push your feet hard in the floor. Okay. Kind of go back and forth like I'm doing here. Um, solid. It's 3.42 on a Tuesday in March. It's a beautiful day. Um, this is a good place to be. It's a good place for all of us to be right now. I was, I'm happy to be here. Happy you're here. Um, just look around the room right now and list five things you see right now. We're right where you are. Five things you see in your room. Uh, a brain, my little toy, a flute, my sunglasses, and my headphones. Name four things that you can feel right now in your room where you are right now in the beginning of March of 2021. Um, I can feel the shirt on my arms. Uh, my booty in my chair, I feel my feet in my shoes and my elbows on my legs. Three things that uh, you can hear right now. I hear cars, I can hear birds outside and I can hear Jack Jack downstairs. Two things you can smell right now. I kind of have a smellless area right now. Let me see, I've got this drink. Okay. Oh, I got the wood of the flute. And one thing you can taste. I'm going to taste my drink in my cool, manly cup. Okay. So here we are. If you remember, okay, no, no, now close your eyes with me. Now, if you remember, um, pushing your feet hard in the ground like that sends a message to the brain that says you aren't drifting off, you aren't flying away, you are in your body, this is occurring right here, right now. We're just updating the brain. We're letting it know, I got it. And then the five, four, three, two, one, the present is a sensory experience. The present is a sensory experience. So see, feel, taste, touch, hear, smell. We, we, we looked at it around and said, yeah, I'm right here in this room. Because when you want to gauge in, in, in poking the bear a little bit is know that well, we are safe here. This is a good spot for us. So I'm just going to do a quick story. Um, so I, with your eyes closed, I want you to, to imagine this as much as you, as you can. Okay? 
So imagine it's your birthday. Imagine it's your birthday. Pretty exciting day. You know what? You even took the day off work because it's all about you today. Celebrating you. And it's not COVID season. And so there's total freedom. We can do whatever we want on your birthday for crying out loud. You're the cheese today. So you decide, you know what? I'm going to go to Rapid. Maybe I'll go to a movie or something. That'll be cool. So you call your friend. And you say, friend, Susie Frybread, what are you doing today? And she says, just waiting for your call, dude. So let's go to Rapid. We'll go out to eat at a buffet. Then we'll go to the movie. It's going to be an awesome day. We'll listen to our favorite music on the way there. Woo! It's going to be a good day. So right when you're getting ready to leave, you're all wash your hair and brush your teeth and put your stuff on that makes you look skinny. And you're getting ready to go. You can't find your wallet. You can't find any. What the heck is my wallet? And you go out to the car, nothing there. You look in your kitchen, is it on a counter somewhere? Is it in my pants? Is it my coat that I was wearing? Can't find it there, can't find it there. Is it in my is it on my dresser somewhere? Is it in the bathroom? You you tear your house apart looking for that. You cannot find your wallet. And had your credit card and had some cash in there, had ID, had everything you live to for you to function is in there. You don't have any money to get to Rapid. You don't have credit cards. You can't put gas in. Oh, man. And it just sucks. And it's just stressful. You keep looking and looking and looking and looking. You cannot find it. So fine, you call your friend, Susie Frybread, and you say, I, I can't find my wallet. I gotta stay home. I, gotta, I, gotta, I can't do anything. And she said, oh, you know what? You left your wallet here. And she said, Chun, it was at her house. So you go over to her house and you knock on the door and you say, well, okay, we gotta go if we're gonna, have this day. So you get over there and you knock on her door and she doesn't answer, crying out loud. She doesn't answer. You knock again, she doesn't answer. Knock again, she doesn't answer. And then you hear, come in. And so you open her door and her house is dark. So dark. You try to feel your way along the wall. Try to find a light. You can't find a light switch. It's dark. What the heck? Why is it so dark in here? But you feel kind of a cool breeze go past your face in the dark. And you finally find a door handle. And you reach down, and you turn the handle slowly, and it creaks. And you open it up and there's Susie Frybread with all your friends in there. Then they say, surprise. And they have a birthday cake waiting for you. All your friends, all the good things. You can open your eyes. When you hear a story, your brain tries to populate it. It tries to fill in the pictures and the blanks. And so it, it becomes, depending how much you want to engage, it becomes very real. And what that story does is it moves us back and forth. Maybe you change a little bit, maybe you frowned a little bit, maybe you smile a little bit at certain parts. That's pendulation. It moves just a little back and forth. And there's different sensations that occur with different parts of the story. So getting acquainted with it 
maybe there was, there was frustration, you couldn't find it, there was relief, there was surprise. If you notice those, hand, those things changing, that was the sympathetic and the parasympathetic being active in your body, pendulating. So when, you, when we, what we want to do is create fluidity between that. Remember, anything that felt uncomfortable or anything that does feel like this on the sympathetic part, that's not the final state. If you, if you were able to feel this fluidity back and forth, you, you're on your way to learning the skills to guide yourself and others through their sensation, their uncomfortable sensations. If you felt stuck or frozen in unpleasant sensations or emotions, kind of take time now to look around and say, well, I'm here. That's why we did the five, four, three, two, one. We're here. If you need to get up, if you need to push, push yourself feet in the ground, if you need to look around, if you need to do HRV breathing, get to know that. It's a learning experience for you. So here's the cool thing. No one's here today. The cool thing is, once we start learning this well, this fluidity, learning language of sensation, learning and in, leaning into it, learning from the body, the body wants to get rid of the trauma. We just have to be good stewards of the process. Come on, come on. That, that changed my life. It changed how I do my work. The people sitting across from me, their anxiety attack, your children's anger, their constriction, is their body trying to get rid of trauma? And they just need these tools that we're talking about that we're starting to dive into. Whew. So next week, we're going to keep diving into things. But we're going to look at more symptoms and more tools um, to help with pendulation. Uh, we'll keep diving into Levine stuff. I th like I said, ultimately, I may do like a three, three or four session training on tapping. Maybe we'll do that the last month. I have to kind of look at the, the schedule. But does anyone have questions or comments or thoughts? I try to leave five, 10 minutes every, every session 